My name is Nicole Meyer, and I'm joining you here from the Field House Museum to welcome you to our speaker series and author talk. Today, I have joining us uh, Jim Merkel. Uh, he is a St. Louis native, um, born and raised. He went to Western Grove High School, Merrimack Community College, and then Mizzou, graduating in 1973. Uh, shortly after graduation, uh, Jim moved to Pennsylvania to work for the United States Information Agency, uh, the New York Times, the Pennsylvania, and the Gray. In 1991, Jim and his family moved back here to St. Louis, uh, back to the Bevo Mill neighborhood, and where he has worked with the suburban journals of Greater St. Louis, covering many major events um, from the Great Flood of 1993 to St. Louis City Council meetings and much, much more. Jim is also author to many books about St. Louis, including Cougars and the Scrubby Dutch, St. Louis' the South Side, Beer, Brats, and Baseball, German Americans in St. Louis, The Making of an Icon, The Dreamers, The Schemers, and The Hard Hat Who Built the Gateway Arch, and The Colorful Characters of St. Louis. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to Jim to begin. Thank you, Nicole. Around 1956, my kindergarten teacher, Gretchen L. Kilpatrick, wrote a report card that did more than tell about my my progress in school. It predicted my future course in life. Jimmy has been a pleasure to have, she wrote. His sense of humor has pepped us up at times. He tries hard and is a good little worker, she wrote. But he on his scattered brain forgetfulness, though. That pretty much sums up things for years, truly who was shown here around first grade. I love to joke, and sometimes I'm even funny, and I'm still, still scatterbrained and still need to work on my forgetfulness, as my wife will tell you about the latest of my keys. But here's the important part about this, about what I just mentioned. Much of who we are is because of who we were as children. And that is about what my book is about. Remember Citizen Kane? His last words were Rosebud. The plot centered around the search for its meaning. What's Rosebud? What's much Rosebud? In the end, it turned out that Rosebud was the sled he had when he was a kid. And it seemed like his whole life, everything he did, was a search for Rosebud. Not long after, long, not long ago, I heard an observation from Paul McCartney. I'm still that little kid that grew up in Liverpool, he told Stephen Colbert. But for me and everybody in the book, the words are, we're still those little kids that grew up in St. Louis. I thought often about my childhood memories and got an idea. To discover the memories of others, more than a hundred of them, in fact, in a book about their experiences growing up in St. Louis, I go around and pretty much at random try to find people. Now, it makes sense to do this, but it, I discovered as a, a you know, I discovered the meaning of the words were still those little kids that grew up in St. Louis as a certainty when I wrote this book. Growing up St. Louis, I outlined my, outlined my plan for a whole book of memories in an email to my publisher in January 2017. They'll be all ages from elementary school to centenarian. They'd be black, white, Male, female, rich, poor, with happy childhood, and sad ones. They have one thing in common, St. Louis. Then I boiled down their experiences and put them in a book about growing up in our town. That's not hard, is it? Did I know? In fact, it was a monster. By far the most difficult of the five books I've written about St. Louis. 
But finding people with an even mix of ages, sexes, races, and personal interests isn't easy. Neither is stepping way out and approaching someone. Imagine asking a stranger who is nothing like you if he would mind being grilled about personal details of his childhood. I got my a share of no's. Some of the, no, the yeses turned into no's when a person stood me up for an appointment. I don't blame them. I respect them, actually. On the other hand, I love those who took a chance and now are in the book I'm talking about. I used Google spreadsheets to keep a balance. I wanted 10 for every decade and as close to five women and five men as I could make it. It didn't work out for centenarians. It's a rare man who lives that long. So I wound up with a lot more women and, than men into that category. I also tried to have African Americans in every decade and match their percentage in the area. It made it more complicated, but I tried to match other groups too. You'll probably tell me that I didn't include your group. For this, I apologize. But on the other hand, this wasn't a scientific study. The spreadsheet did more than help maintain a balance. It helped me keep track of everybody I interviewed. Remember what this Kilpatrick said about my category? This helped me keep things clear. I included their birthdays, the most interesting things they told me, and contact information. I don't know what I would have done without it. I found my subjects in all kinds of ways, including walking up to somebody with green hair at a fair and asking him, could I interview you for my book? This turned out to be a good interview. Some were relatives, or friends of relatives and friends. Some came from church or a request through Facebook. I told PR people, anybody really, to ask for help. One, one of my sources told me not long ago, how do you find me? And I said, I don't remember. Oh. About two, 25 of them came to the St. Louis Public Library. I spent four Saturdays in October 2017 at different branches of that library finding them. They even put out a flyer for me just to uh, get some information. And St. Louis Public Library Auditorium Coordinator Joe Schwartz put out word that people might get in a book if they showed up at one of those Saturdays and talked to me about their experiences growing up in St. Louis. There was one catch. The launch event for that book had to be a program in the central auditorium of the, down, uh, down, of the central library downtown. Uh, it would have worked out, only the program was scheduled for this April early, and as you recall, things didn't work out. Thankfully, we have programs like this to fill the void. From the first Saturday to, uh, to the last of that thing, my subjects did not disappoint. Their, st their stories were marvelous and provided a perspective that I probably wouldn't have elsewhere. What a joy to meet so many different kinds of people, all with their own stories. I'm happy that many of the people I interviewed before became friends. Eighteen of them met me for lunch one Sunday afternoon in late March 2019 at C.J. Muggs in downtown Webster Groves to tell their stories again. The tales of the 18 were amazingly different. So, so were the stories of everybody I interviewed. Now, uh, just to say, for example, uh, this, this woman right here told me about her experiences uh, practicing duck and cover, where they how they would save themselves from the bomb pen. Uh, this woman told me about how she, uh, her experiences seeing the, the Beatles uh, on uh, uh, the Beatles on TV first, when they first came over here. Uh, this guy uh, was mentioned to me about what happened when he would when he 
learned that uh, that President Kennedy had been shot. Uh, he said he took the bus home and he, he would look out and everywhere he looked, people looked stunned and out of it. I could say many things for a lot of people now and for how the wonderful stories that I always got and how I became friends. And you've got to be a friend when somebody you never met opens up to you about a memory of childhood either sad or happy. Then you review your recording or notes of that interview and you write it down and you review, review, review. Finally, you check back with them endlessly. Yes, all that makes you a friend. In many ways, the way I picked them up was like opening an old phone book and placing my finger anywhere on the page. I had no idea who I would find and what they would say. They arrived in the book at random, but they all, all had stories to tell, and that's part of the fun of the book. The stories I heard made me realize how important it is for everybody to record their childhood experiences. Think about your growing up experiences and how they made you feel that you are. Learn about the childhood experiences of others, Maybe even buy my book, or you expect that I would say that, and read the stories I collect. Use it to record your mom, dad, aunt, or uncles talking about growing up here, or yourself. Listen now as I recount the stories of some of them in the first person. Stories like this one from Dorothy Hunter. Now here she is uh, at the left, and she's on a tour to her wife are um, two of her siblings. But she lived in this house right here, south of Tower Grove Park. She had, and it's still there, Connecticut Street. And she was born in 1907. And she, she was 109 years old when I interviewed her in 2017. She died a few months later at the age of 110. Here, I was, for 50 minutes, I taped her experiences like it was a time machine. And she told me about going down to, uh, going downtown. She told me about going to a silent movie show when her father allowed it. Uh, she told me about uh, taking the streetcar, and she told me this one about going with her family to Union Station to watch her uncle go off to World War One. Now her father was very strict; he did not permit chewing gum. Right there, my uncle, my my uncle gave each of the kids a package of chewing gum. A whole package, and we were in seventh heaven, and there wasn't a thing my father could say, because this was a gift from a man who was about almost at war. She told me other things. She said it was either take the streetcar or walk. There was one car on Arsenal Street and one on Grand. I walked the streetcar. One time, I walked on the streetcar, and that, that was when I had passed up to a certain age. And the conductor refused to take my ticket because he thought I was too old. I was just tall. Then I got off the car and got on the, the next car. Now, if I had one, one word to use about the way we were brought up, what my father believed in, it was moderation. Now, this is Margaret Whitaker on her 104th birthday, celebrating. And she had a story to tell about standing at the women's rights back in the 1920s. Since her family lived west of Kirkwood, her father would have to pay for her to go to Kirkwood High School. But he didn't want her to go to high school. But, she said, I did it myself. I wanted to go. I always wanted to be a teacher, and I did. I had to talk to the superintendent of schools, and he told me that I should go to Kirkwood 
and live with this woman as a maid and take care of her and look after her. She worked for the county newspaper. I lived with her for five years and finished high school. I was right near school. I could walk. What am I saying? She graduated from Kirkwood High School, and she graduated from college, and she became a school teacher. Here's another woman who lived uh, with a much different story, Louise Jimerson. She was born in 1917 and grew up in Madison, Illinois. Here's a picture of her when I interviewed her when she was 100. Like many African Americans, she told about a county that was racism, but she also had a rich family history and tradition. We used to have 14 grocery stores here during my childhood, grocery stores on every corner. I remember chicken neck bones were three pounds for 25 cents, and Wonder Bread was five cents a loaf. We got candy and pickles and gum. I remember my mother used to cook a lot of potatoes. My grandmother used to bake some cookies for us. Sugar cookies, we call them. My grandmother and my mother would cook Sunday dinner, and we'd have fried chicken, mashed potatoes, peas, potato pie, pecan pie, apple cobbler, cobbler, peach cobbler, cherry cobbler. Oh, my grandmother and my mother always, oh, we canned fruit in the fall. They made them into preserves, strawberry preserves, preserves. Blackberry preserves. Oh, my dad was a, a custodian at Dunbar School in Madison, Illinois for 30 years, and my mother was a homemaker. It was my grandmother who lived with us, who did the disciplining. And a side note, that's what I found generally in the African American home is the grandmother who does this. And oh, she said she always was banking and was smart. Next day to, door to me was my uncle. He'd always be up over at our place for Sunday. It seemed like we always had seven or eight people there. Now, I went to visit one of my aunts in Memphis when I was 13 years old. She told me how to get, go to downtown Memphis on the street cart. There weren't buses then. I remember sitting on the front row behind the conductor, and the conductor looked back at me. He said, Really? He called me, really? Where are you from? New York? I told him, no, I was from St. Louis. And he told me, next time you get on the streetcar, you go back as far as the white stop on the streetcars. When I got up, he said, you remember what I told you. Now, here is another one. Madeline Kish. Well, Actually, she was called the dry back then, and I'll explain why. My mother, she was a good lady, a hard-working lady, and my father was a nice, good man, too, at least the way I remember him. I did not have bad feelings for him. Then he, then he met his, this lady, and uh, you know how ladies can be. He was with her, and she was not going to accept just living with somebody. She wanted marriage, and that's what she insisted on. So he asked my mother for a divorce, but she did not want it. And so he left her, which was awful. I don't even want to tell the story. They took her to the hospital. Then when I woke up one morning, but it was too late. I was eight years old when she died. My brother, who was 18 or 19 at the time, stuck with me and stayed with me until I got a home and then he left. I had, I had heard that he lived in California for a while, but I've never seen him since. And that's hard to, it's just sad to think about it. After that, my uncle tried to get a home for me instead of putting me in an orphanage. Elsie and Charles Pedrotti took me from there. My mother had died and I needed a home and they didn't want to put me in an orphanage, so they raised me. They were very really good parents. They sent me to Catholic schools and had me baptized first thing. I had a very good life with them, especially after losing the rest of my family. 
Now here is Elizabeth June Pepper. We live right on Oakland and Kings Highway on Arco Avenue, right behind St. Louis University High School. The Depression was hard because money was tight and we were pretty poor. By trade, Dad was a butcher, but to make him ends meet, he just did odd jobs. He did a little trade tree work, or he did some painting. He was very good at carpentry work. He was very talented in whatever he set out to do. It seemed like he could do anything. Mother Trump took in washing and ironing for a while. Later on, she worked for Sears and Roebuck on King's Highway. Now, a lot of men wanted odd jobs around the house, and my mother would give them a sandwich or something. We always had a little garden in the back, and she was generous. We heard they were giving out shoes to the people that needed them. So somebody took us downtown and got us a pair of shoes. Instead of coming to a point around it at the toe, they came straight across like a oh like a box, ugly round. I hated them, but I had to wear them. Now everybody in the neighborhood lived like the scrubby Dutch, which meant we kept our houses sparkling. Sparkling clean. I scoured the outside of our house many times, all with the steps. We used common or whatever they had then. We scrubbed those concrete steps so clean that we used to think it was fun. You didn't dare to walk up on the stairs if your shoes were dirty. Now I have a special reason for loving this picture. The, that fellow on the front, that little kid, that is my that is my uncle, Sidney Durr, who was born in 1927, uh, and behind him is my it was the little brother, my uncle Don. And uh, he and Sid, Uncle Sid, I uh, loved him, man. He died not long ago at the age of, nine, of 91. Here, here's his story. When times got hard, nobody would buy anything in hardware stores. So my dad lost his hardware store in Old Orchard and Webster Groves. He moved all his stuffs into the basement. My job was to go get the lawnmowers and bring it to him, bring him for, to sharpen. After he lost the store, my dad got a job uh, in a hat company. During the Depression, my mother took care of three old ladies. The neighbors behind us, they were really bored. And we kind of helped them too. That's how we got along. Everybody helping out. There wasn't any politics. On my fifth birthday, August 6, 1932, I got a beautiful red wagon. I rode the wagon down Tuxedo onto the police station road where a big truck <laughs> carrying rocks ran over me. A doctor was behind me and brought me to the hospital. All the while, I was crying because my red, red wagon was gone. And he had another reason to love the date, August 6, because on August 6, 1945, his birthday, he was headed toward, uh, he was headed toward Japan when they dropped the bomb, and you would never argue with him about whether the bomb was necessary. Now, next one, Marjorie, Jones Raker, born, she born in the 20s, and she lived in DeSoto. Now, in the 1930s, sooty high, high sulfur coal from southern Illinois powered St. Louis's furnaces, factories, and trains, and it darkened the daylight uh, sky and covered everything with a dark dust. Going, and she said, going to St. Louis from DeSoto was a three-hour trip, and occasionally we did not, did have to come to St. Louis on a shopping trip. I remember being at famous bar downtown, coming out the 7th Street side and not being able to see the Forum Cafeteria from across the street because of all the smoke. When we got home to DeSoto after one of those shopping trips, we wiped our faces with a Kleenex and it was I knew people in DeSoto who had moved away from St. Louis to escape the smoke 
for their health. Now, I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from, but I knew there were people in my class at school who did. I remember people coming to our house for food. They were never turned down. They would sit on my back, Brooks, and eat a sandwich. World War II and the Great Depression were the defining events of my lifetime and my husband's family. The now, the Depression ended with the start of World War II, but in many ways, kids' lives still were hard. After that, those who experienced the Depression and the war focused on one thought, our kids will have it better than they did, than we did. Our, they lavished themselves on their kids. With dad at work and mom at home, all kinds of kids found themselves in the most, the greatest period of prosperity in the history of the world. Again and again, people related how they went out after breakfast and didn't come back until lunch. Then they scampered off with instructions to come back before the street lights came on. This was as close to universal as you can get. Now, uh, here is uh, the, the girl in the, in the middle. She's Cora French, and she's now Cora French Katzen. Uh, she was born in 1943, uh, before actually the baby boomers, but close enough. Uh, and this is such a delightful picture that one of being part of our front cover. Uh, she said, I grew up in the most wonderful neighborhood of all, South St. Louis, one and a half blocks from Shores Garden and three blocks from Tower Grove Park. That, those were my playground. The Center Street, Shenandoah, was tree-lined, forming an arch over the street. We walked to school, we walked to the Admiral, we walked to shop. We knew almost all of our neighbors, and they knew us. Back then, there were no bomb threats, no terrorists, no guns, no gangs. There were movie theaters we could walk to, doctors, dentists, clothing stores, shoe stores, candy stores, and even a smelly place where you could choose a live chicken to be butchered for Sunday dinners. We played outside until the street guards, street lights came on and we were free to be just kids. That meant we could play hide and seek, kick the tin can down the hot alley, hide out in the ash pits, climb trees, and roam in the park. She's a, she was a neat lady, and she really, she really is. Here is John Barn Hearns. He's uh, protecting his uh, parents' house in Ferguson. She, he was born in a uh, barn in 48, and he moved with his family in Ferguson in 51. And he said, my, my mother's cowbell was the precursor to the smartphone. We had kind of a herd mentality. There were 20 kids living on the same cul-de-sac that were uh, with us. We got kicked out of our house in the morning during summer and had to come back for dinner. The cowbell was how she communicated with us. We ran around and did all kinds of things until that cowbell rang. We were all on the same party line for the phone, and you knew when somebody got on the phone, if you were talking, you got off. Oh, it's you. OK, I'll call them back later. Then finally, the phone man came to in to separate phones to give everybody a uh, private line. So the phone guy going to each of the houses came to my house and he says, are you all related? And my mother said, no, why do you say that? Well, all the kids ran to this house and then they went, ran to that house and they went off to all the houses. Hmm. Now, when I both lived in Ferguson, the Wabash train that went downtown would sound the horn in the evenings. To me, it was like a familiar friend. At night, when you heard that, it was kind of saying, everything's OK. It was always struck, it always stuck with me. And later on, when I went to, with my, to see my grandmother in Pittsburgh, they had
had a streetcar that made the same noise as it went down the rails. I love that familiar sound. Now you may be why is the great uh, San Francisco great uh, giant's great uh, in this? Uh, why is he here? And I'll explain that. This is the story of Mono Smith, who was born in 1952. My dad barnstormed in the Nate Negro Lakes down in Mississippi with the Memphis Red Sox. The story that's better for me is how he turned me into a baseball player. He played semi-pro baseball in Candy Park in front of Sumner High School in the 1950s. But the year he broke his ankle, sliding into home plate was the year that my little league baseball career started. That's when he started coaching me. The first year he got 60 boys and eight dads on a baseball diamond in Fairground Park. Out of the 60 boys, three teams came along. We were some of the first teams in Matthews Dickey Boys and Girls Club. Dad would get all kinds of things for the team. He got his company to sponsor the uniforms. Our block unit sponsored our uniforms, as, and as did some of his friends who owned businesses. We went to a barber shop, and back in those times, the African Americans played players in the Cardinals and visiting teams who did not stay at the hotel. So anytime a blind player came in from out of town, they stayed in a rooming house near the barber shop. It was my neighbor's shop. We got to meet everybody. Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, and Jackie Robinson. All the favorite, the famous African-American baseball players of the time. We also got to meet football and basketball players, all of the one, this one baseball barber shop, because it was walking distance from the bar boarding house. Kurt Flood came to the shop to get his hair cut and to socialize. Because he was shorter and smaller than my dad, I said, Dad, who is this guy? Now, they call this generation that we're talking about the baby boomers because there were so many of them, and so they kind of boomed after the war. Now, there was, we were the ones who watched Leave it to Beaver and visited the apples every summer. We grew up with the Beatles, and we went to dances with Bob Cuban. And you know something? We were grateful. We even rebelled with the idea of going off to war. One of those who rebelled was William Quinlan. He told me this. When I was a senior at Southwest High School, I participated in helping put together Olivia Brown newspaper. There were kids from 32 or 33 high schools working on it the day it was published in 1969. While we were distributing issues, we were all kicked out of high school. I went to a farm of night school for students who had been expelled. There were kids who that had were kicked out for various reasons, including some girls who were pregnant. In those days, if you got pregnant, you finished in high school. It was just sort of a mixed group of kids. I don't remember if it was more than two or three months. So, the, so there was all kinds of different things. As life went on, uh, people, the, uh, people became more aware of the African Americans. And here is one of them, Kurt Walker. He was born in 1968. This is a very sweet story of living in a block where whites and uh, blacks really love each other. Uh, the, the September, he's to the, he's to the left, and his cousin is to the right. The September prior to my birth, my parents moved from North City to University City. We were the second black family on my block. My family still owns the house. Next door was his family, last name Linthicum, and my dad went to business with Jack Linthicum, and they had a, land, a landscaping business uh, company.
company for many years and they loved each other dearly. Jack went on to open up a plant nursery on Lindbergh. At the time they opened the business, he, he, he opened the business, Jack asked my dad, do you want to come? Let's live together. And he said, no, my dad said, uh, because he wasn't a risk taker. I'll just stay at Jewish Hospital, my full-time job. So they ended up being good friends the day uh, I buried my dad a couple of years ago. Jack was there. I remember growing up as a kid, and we had all these pictures of family over the fireplace mantle. I'm the youngest of six siblings, so there were a lot of faces there. And there was like a little white girl with a long straight hair, and that was my parents' goddaughter. Her name was Hockmeister. And there was a Jewish guy my dad and my mom loved doing business with named Rosen. In my house, I saw all kinds, all races of people. Now there was his story, but there was harder stories, like this guy, Darren Seals, who has turned his, his life around, but he's, he's been rough. He said, he was born in 1969 in Shum when he was a teenager. Even though I, my parents had good jobs, they would pass down the shoes. By selling drugs, I had enough money to buy my own shoes. Everything was based on the shoes. I go out of the house with the shoes my mom gave me and look under the porch to get my own shoes. I got clothes, shoes, jewelry, girls. If you want a car, you've got to get out there and do what you need to get it. You're looking at, at being a freshman in high school netting 3,000 or 4,000 a year. Once my mother found, found out, she said I've got to go. I went to Northwest High School on my freshman and sophomore years, and then fighting. I played baseball well, so Oakville High School accepted me as a desegregation student. I didn't sell drugs there because I felt I had a purpose. I had made B's and F's in the city, but I had a C average with only a couple of D's in Oakville. I made a few friends who knew I was determined and each English teacher encouraged me. If I was still out in Oakville, I'd probably be a professional baseball, a baseball player. Now here is somebody, somebody with a much happier story, Anne Marie Nart, who was born in 19, she was right here uh, with the big, the, all the red hair over to the right. So she said, the majority of my friends that I pal around with lived in my neighborhood in Crestwood. We would cut through our uh, neighbor's yards, go up to their houses, and see if they were home almost every day after school. I lived in that neighborhood until I was in third grade. Every day after school, we would pretty much spend the daylight hours together. And we had elaborate imaginary games and that we had devised that kept us pretty busy. In that summer, I knew we spent the majority of the day exploring the creek in the Crestwood Park. Climbing trees, playing games. We would spend hours and hours in that creek exploring. I think we were really lucky that we were just old enough have a childhood free from screens and electronic devices. I did not play or see a video game until I was 12 and saw, saw it in my cousin's home. I almost never, I also never watched the Saturday morning cartoons. I think I was, we were very sheltered from that kind of screen time. My parents just encouraged getting outside and playing with our friends. I had piano lessons, but it didn't show up that much time. Mostly it was very unstructured, go out and play. Now over time, as we've seen, there have been changes. Uh, I always thought that my, uh, in my life, 
I was very different from my parents because they knew one and they're from country of the war. Uh, but today, the difference between us and kids is gigantic. If you tell somebody today you allowed your child to walk around for hours at a time, she would think you were irresponsible. In numerous ways, kids of the 2000s were in a vastly different world than the parents and grandparents. Interracial marriage is taken as normal, so is same-sex same marriage. Uh, for many period parents, the structured play date replaced unstructured play with any kid who was available in the neighborhood. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported in 2016 that one out of 20 kids took medicine for attention, deficit, hyperactivity disorder. Now those are just some of the many changes that, there, that there's been. Shakespeare usually could have had the kids of the 2000s in mind when he penned the words, oh brave new world that had such people in it. Generation Z, from born from 1995 to 2015 is vastly different. Now here is one member of Generation Z that I'll talk about. The, she is Tabitha Stowers. Here she's shown in November 4th, 2017, when she received, she was named the uh, homecoming queen for Kirkwood. She admitted to me, and so she was born in, two, in 2000, she admitted to me that she sometimes would use her phone in class but only after she had free time, after she did her work at, in class. I text like every day, she said. How often? Perhaps uh, about every five minutes, she said. She's mixed fresh. And she said, I feel like I'm torn sometimes with situations like that from the St. Louis. It feels like I have to pick sides all the time. Sometimes me and my dad have talks. He's told me to be cautious. I know we've been caught, <coughs> gotten pulled over before for having dark, for having license. Uh, he says that the reason he got pulled over is because he's African American. Everybody's been pretty accepting of me, especially at school, because there are a lot of mixed race kids at my school too. Now, one more. Here's, but also, here's one more uh, uh, from Gen Z. While many Awita uh, born in 2004, uh, she says, I grew up in St. Louis. My parents moved from Nigeria to the United States, and they had me a year later. I was just kind of trying to figure out who I am because I really couldn't classify myself. I wasn't all the way American, but I wasn't all the way Nigerian. So what was I? Where did I fit in? I really didn't think I would much of anything. But my parents told me that just because you're from Nigeria, that doesn't mean you're not special. And just because you grew up in America, doesn't mean you're anything less. You are who you are. Nigerian, American, and you should be proud. Growing up with, a, with refugee immigration, immigrant parents really makes you want to work harder than you are in the United States, when you are in the United States, because they're constantly reminding you of all that they went through to get here. If I come back with any with a grade lower than a B, it's over. So we have one more thing. Teacher. This is Milo Marston. He's the youngest. He was born of the people I interviewed. He was born in 2008, uh, more than 100 years after Dorothy Hunter. And as it happens, he's holding Dorothy Hunter's picture, and he's been standing in front of Dorothy Hunter's house, and he happened that he lives in the same block as Dorothy, that Dorothy Hunter did. And how is that for a coincidence? They could have lived in thousands of different places, but they didn't. And I, and so I, they have, uh, he has quite a thing to look for. So if it seems that today's children have gone through a lot, kids have always 
suffered disruption. Those in my book lived through one small part of the world that experienced racist mud, poverty, war, and so much more. They faced influenza in 1918, hunger in the 1930s, and polio in the 1950s. They grew up learning about, about the bomb, yet they survived. They made friends and advantage. The mud pies that they made were castle. They endured tragedy. I lived among loving parents who filled their lives with happy events. Kids today face disaster and climate change, wars, and exploding rare world population. I would love to hear the stories 50 or 60 years from now about going through the pandemic. Uh, what it, what will it be about? Will it be about wearing the mask? What will it be about? Uh, staying at home and not their friends, so many different things. Uh, but for whatever happens, there's one thing that's sure. Kids today still act like kids. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, in many ways. 
ways you can, um, in, in many ways, uh, they're common. You can just uh, switch out the, uh, the stories of going to the driving your bike to a little one dollar uh, one dollar movie movie shop uh, place. That was any place in the country, and uh, but so in that way it was. But yeah, there there are ways uh, that it, it is uh, that it was just here. Yeah. Good. Just the last question. Sure. In your opinion, what makes growing up in St. Louis unique? What makes oh, what, what, what I said. Uh, St. Louis, and I really love St. Louis. St. Louis is easy. St. Louis is, uh, you know, you just, uh, and there's so many fun. No, I, I think that there's that. Uh, it, it's, um, that there's, you know, well, there's the two things, and there's the fact that there's so many neighborhoods. Uh, but of course, neighborhood, it's not a bad that you have a neighborhood and that you have, uh, that you have, uh, people remember growing up in, on the hill, or people remember growing up uh, uh, in uh, St. Louis Hills, or West Groves. Uh, these are all wonderful places. Uh, so, um, I'll, I'll say it's, it's probably, it's one of the more positive things. Okay. Well, Thank you again for joining us. Um, you can purchase Growing Up in St. Louis, Looking Through the Decades, at jimmarkletherwriter.com. Uh, and again, we really enjoyed having you here, and you can also find his other books um, on the website as well. And, uh, the museum is open right now. We are open Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 4 p.m., and Sunday, noon to 4, so you you can come down here and take a tour still. Um, as for right now, our programs will be remaining online um, in formats such as this. So make sure you stay updated on our Facebook page for any events that may be coming up. We're going to be continuing our speaker series and our author series throughout the holidays. Um, so again, we're really happy and excited to have you here. And again, uh, this was Growing Up in St. Louis, uh, looking back through the decades. And you can, this will be posted and continue stay on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you missed the first half, you can always just go on back. Yeah. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest.